Well, thanks for joining me, guys. I, I just want to congratulate you, first of all, on the Emmy nomination. must be really gratifying to, to see your work nominated and uh, put in front of all your contemporaries and your colleagues and, you know, a celebration of what you did. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's, it is, it's, it's, it's really rewarding. It's also, you know, a bit unexpected. We don't do it, you know, for, for this moment in time, but to actually be acknowledged and have the work appreciated in the way it is, is, is really gratifying, really fulfilling. It's really nice. It, it does mean though, that you have to, you know, up your game constantly now, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, no pressure, so pressure's on. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, of course, had that wonderful uh, afternoon, or was it morning? I can't remember. Back in May at Star Wars Celebration, where we had uh, a thousand people turn up to come and listen to you guys talk about your work along with Richard Vandenberg, who did the, the special effects on, on the show. Um, it was a great chance for the fans to come along and, and listen to sort of behind the scenes stories and to talk to you guys. We're going to go over much of the same material here because I, you know, one of the regrets of that panel is that it wasn't recorded and we couldn't get it out in any other form. So it's great that I've got the opportunity to talk to you again. And uh, we will cover some of the same ground, but I'm, you know, I, I could talk about this all day, as, as I'm sure you're aware, but hopefully it will be about an hour as well. Moen, looking at the concept of Andor, it's not your typical Star Wars show. It doesn't have the typical tropes. There aren't really, there aren't Jedi. There aren't that many space battles as such, really. We don't have lightsabers. Did did that impact on how you approached the effects work? Um, you know, was that freeing that you didn't have those big flashy moments and you could have more subtlety in the show? How how did that sort of guide your approach? Yeah, I, I think it definitely did have an um, did have an effect on it. In a way, it's an extension that both the work that we did on Rogue One that both TJ and I had had worked on before with Tony Gilroy, who was the showrunner of Andor. And I think uh, early on we had conversations about um, the aesthetic that that Tori was looking for for this uh, for this show. You know, like back in in 2019 when we first talked about it. And I think to him as well, what was important was that everything had to feel grounded, had to feel sort of believable because the story is not about larger than life figures it's not about you know people with superpowers and and uh, heavy fantasy elements um but really once again like rogue one sort of more about you know the the quote unquote normal people and and their struggles and so with that it was really important to him that uh everything felt sort of tangible and and tactile and and believable so i think more than uh we always try to sort of take inspiration from from the real world, but I think uh, with this show, more than with uh, with some of the other Star Wars projects, we really try to anchor everything in something um, uh, that would exist in reality. So, on the one hand, uh, when we're creating environments, we always try to have something we could shoot first. You know, not placing people in front of things that were entirely made up. But either having a set or for Coruscant, quite often like London locations, that we could um, basically take the director and the um, uh, DP could go there and actually find their angles, take advantage of the real light, the real weight of the architecture. And then sometimes we would still um, replace like 80% of the frame with visual effects ultimately later on. But I think to give everything that that grounded feel, it's really important that that the camera was always pointed at at something that would provide the basis for what what would eventually make out of it. Mm, yeah, there is that really grounded feel to the show. I often think of those the way that we kind of get the establishing shot on a on a new location. It's not like your typical Star Wars wide shot. It's it's a kind of, has an everyday feel to it. Like there's that opening shot with Cassian that walkway, which I believe was shot in, in Essex, um, which is like 10 miles from where I am now. Um, and we see the rain, we see his footsteps on the ground. We're sort of grounded into that moment. And then the the work that was done on set and with the special effects is then backed up by you guys. Uh, TJ, can you talk about how the the special effects work and the on-set work influenced your work? Absolutely. Uh, the, the, it, in in the spirit of of the the collaboration this show provided, which was immense, and and I mean, and everyone involved played such a pivotal role, which is also nice for us because we're we're interacting closely with every single department, and so with special effects, we were able to 
to, to, to build out and find the proper handoff between the practical and the digital so that we got just as much practical work in as we needed versus when our digital extensions would take over or effects would take over. And that, that opening, that opening shot is a, is a good example because we had to have rain, we had to have wind, we had to have all these pieces that, that, that you got somewhat on location, but we also needed to shoot elements for, for so much of the, of the work in the show. We were relying simply on, on digital creations of elements. So working hand in hand with Richard and his team, we were able to get rain, fire, smoke, explosion, everything that we needed, uh, that you see in the show essentially has some basis of practicality built into it. And, and being able Mm -hmm. to work hand in hand with somebody like that certainly helps make it very easy to understand whose responsibility is what, so that there isn't, you know, a a preponderance of of one department, uh, over another, it's everybody Mm -hmm. working in concert together. I I think also on that note, um, I think we were on the one hand, uh, collectively, we're saying at the start, let's try to do as much practical as we can. But uh, eventually, I have to say, in some sequence, we were even surprised ultimately how uh, much was possible practical and how little we had to do in post. So, for example, in episode three, there's the shootout in the abandoned factory with all these giant metal pieces hanging from the ceiling that come crashing down. Um, that was basically all done practically. We There were ultimately like maybe two shots or so in the sequence where just for safety reasons we had to shoot things in several layers where the actors were separate from the thing falling down but other than that like uh, other than the blaster shots but all of the interactions of these things swinging around and crashing down was done entirely practically in a real set and so it's fantastic fun and a lot of that was able to be achieved because it was well planned as well so again it is getting the departments together so we had a good sense of the set and the space from from luke hole and the art department and their team we pre the the entire sequence with special effects with production design with the director with the dp so that everybody knew to to an absolute certainty what would happen then you get there on the day and there's always the intangibility of of real things happening and and it went off perfectly exactly what we wanted uh and 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 that's you know the way that it can all come together in a, in a really really good way yeah I, I the panel i asked richard about that uh sequence and said you know how much work is his and how much work is is yours and he said well you're gonna have to ask those guys and then moan when you said it was almost 100 percent practical he, he decided it was his favorite sequence of of the entire yeah, series <laughs> which amused me um um scott we we sort of talking about you know these these practical elements and working with something to ground things on. You were in charge of the aerial unit as part of your job, and you did some some shooting and had you know you come across when you're doing things practically. You come across those happy accidents that you might not happen to come across if you weren't doing them in that way. Um, you went out to Lanzarote, was it that you shot right, some of the yeah. arrows? Yeah. And what was the experience like in doing that? Oh, it was incredible. I mean, um, to go up in a helicopter with a a stabilized camera on the front um, and go and shoot aerial plates is 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 really something. Um, and yeah, I mean, the happy accidents. We had the 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 plan was that Ferrex was going to be this you know, kind of overcast, slightly misty, boggy environment. Um, we had a a set um, in uh, of the Ferrex town uh, itself, uh, built in, in Marlow in Bahinshire, and just outside of London, and yeah. You know, predominantly fairly fairly overcast um plates for that um and then we also shot some uh, reference uh, photography up in port aiton seaton which is a, a dockyard where they dismantle oil rigs and we had these incredible photographs of these huge oil rigs just looming out of this amazing mist and fog um so that was definitely the, the kind of the desired aesthetic now the canary islands is predominantly quite a sunny um location uh but we you know that had been chosen because of the amazing volcanic red and black soil that's there in the tin and fire national park with volcanic national park and as part of manzarotti and we got the helicopter set up and we were due to go on a test flight and um, just to check that the weight of of everything was okay because when you hang a big heavy camera off the nose of the helicopter it just has to be they have to make sure that the, the balance is right in the back of the helicopter so it can fly properly so we went on a test flight 
flew up into the mountains and suddenly it was just this incredible foggy misty backlit beautiful um environment and the camera operator and i just kind of turned to each other should we just shoot this so <laughs> a 10 minute test flight turned into like a, an hour and a half shoot and we shot i think i think we shot 80 percent of the the shots that we were due to get wow. over the next couple of days on that one shoot and it, yeah they were just beautiful it's great when you come across something like that where you wouldn't necessarily think that, you know, you're going to get the results that you were intending to get. You know, it is those happy accidents, isn't it, that, you know, we we assume don't happen in visual effects anymore. But of course they do, because you're using each of the different disciplines of your job to as a tool to to create the best environment that you can. We also saw in some of the press, I think, later on and maybe in our panel as well, that you used some of the stagecraft um technology so the big leds but not in the way that people would imagine i think people need to be reminded and i'm hoping you're going to do that in a moment but people would need to be reminded that this isn't like a a technology that's going to solve every problem you know i recently spoke to pablo hellman who worked on the fablemans with um, spielberg you know and they did some screencraft stuff or stagecraft stuff with uh with the car scene um can you talk a little bit about how you use that LED technology, but in ways that people wouldn't necessarily expect? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so for the stagecraft build for this particular show, it was due to provide these environment extensions to the Chandravan embassy on Carson. So the set, um, the set guys at Pinewood built this amazing set of the embassy. And there were two main rooms in this set. There was a dining room, which had a long straight wall with lots of windows um, in, a, in a line. And then there was also a, a parlor room, which is a much more kind of intimate and closed set where you know more private conversations could be had. And that had a curved um, bench mm. with a curved series of windows behind it. And what we did, we had the, our LED walls were alongside both of those there were two walls there was one which was the straight one and then one which curved around the windows and the job of the stagecraft um mm -hmm. content was basically to provide uh the the coruscant locations outside so the views out to the city so we we developed four times a day for two views one out the dining room and one out the parlor mm -hmm. and we could instantly switch between um foggy night to rainy day to clear day so it could alter depending on the time of day that was set up for the sequence. But one of the key things that we had for stagecraft was that we could we have a, an iPad on set where we can control a lot of the various elements of the content on the screen. So we can mm. shift different layers of the city around. We can adjust exposure and right. um, color balance of the the, um, the the content. So we work very, very closely with the director of photography to make sure that that, that is another, you know, aesthetic element of the shot so it's again it's 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 um it's something that the director of photography has you know a vested interest in so you know we we work very very closely with them just to make sure that that's got the right photographic look mm. when it's viewed through the camera yeah has it been difficult to kind of get di uh, directors of photography to kind of adopt this new technology is there some sort of cynicism towards it or initial kind of oh this is too bright or this is too you know too difficult to work with or is it an, is it a tool that they find easy to adapt to i mean philosophically we're not you know we we look for the right tool for the right sure. challenge that we're trying to solve in the production so it's not forcing tool sets on anybody it's really going, well, well, here's a set, here's here's a scene that we have to achieve. What's the best way to do it? And in this situation, Stagecraft was absolutely the best option. Mm -hmm. So when it's discussed as a collaborative effort, again, it becomes a very simple conversation of here's what you get, here's here's what it is. But then it is inherently a, a DP conversation in terms of lighting and, and the creative aspect of it. Yeah, but I, I've so far we uh I'm on on both seasons, have not had a um, DP ever turn down the opportunity to like with a LED screen, just because they know how much more control it gives them, you know. Sure. And so, because uh, because normally the alternative would have been that we would have had a big blue screen out there, which do doesn't even function as a light source. So for daytime scenes where you want the majority of your light to be actually like daylight that comes in, the LED mm. screens are so much better. The other thing to keep in mind is that that really over the last few years now. Um, 
all of the DPs are working in a way where they have a, an operator standing next to them with an iPad that has full control over every single light that's in the set down to like blinking LED lights and giant sky panels and everything. And they'll just, their, their job now is to go like, okay, make that one, you know, 10% darker, a little bit red over here, stop that blinking. And to then have another operator standing next to them and go like, I'll make the sky a little bit brighter and take that down. They're perfectly comfortable with that. So I think it, it worked out really, really well. Yeah, it's great that people are adopting the, those new methods. One thing that we've not really discussed, and maybe we should just take a couple of minutes to do so, is to kind of talk about your different role titles and how they interact with each other. Because otherwise, I'm just going to mess it up. It's better coming from you. So uh, I'm I'm the Bitvex supervisor on the studio side with um, with TJ being the VFX producer, and then uh, Scott was the um, uh, ILM visual effects or is the ILM visual effects supervisor. Um, because we we do ultimately work with with multiple vendors on the show, and so um, uh, I'm I'm sort of overseeing the whole thing, and I'm present on the shoot uh, the whole time. Scott oversaw in post production all of the work done by ILM. Okay, okay. And TJ has to make sure it comes in on time and on budget. <laughs> yeah, work through all the logistics, all all the planning, <laughs> and make sure that 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 everybody's working in concert together. Uh, as well as the collaboration between all of our departments on the show side, and uh, and between you know everyone that works from our previs, postvis vendors, the, the third floor that we're using with Jen Kitching, who's our supervisor, uh, through uh, all of our vendors, so ILM, Hybrid, Scanline, Soho VFX, and Rising Sun, who who all played a, a key component, as well as our in-house team that was led by Mark Hutchings. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of us work together, feeding all of the creative pieces into Moen, who then ensures that we've got a consistency over the, the 12 episodes of the show <laughs> and that everything matches Tony's vision. I mean, it's a, it's, it's quite an undertaking, but that's why we need everybody to, to, to do their piece and their part. And we have partners like Scott, it, it becomes a very fulfilling and, and rather fun experience. One other thing that I'm interested about in terms of the supervisor role is how you can kind of draw all of the threads together and create a kind of cohesive look and ensure there is a cohesive look. What what kind of methods do you use to ensure that everyone is kind of on the same page? I mean, one of the things that, that has, on this show, what has really helped is that we've known, um, you know, Tony since Rogue One. And so I think that mm. there is sort of a bit of a shorthand already with expectations and also a lot of trust where quite frequently uh, he would just sort of describe in broad terms what he's after aesthetically and then allow us to sort of put something together and present it to him. Um, I think for me personally, it's also just uh, the really close collaboration with the production designer, with Luke Hull, um, who's just been fantastic. And, and it's just been this really good collaboration and both on a practical side to say like, okay, well, how much set do we need to build? How much can we then do digital extensions? How do we really spend our time and money wisely between the, the real things and the, the digital things? But then also making sure that all of those things fit together, that the aesthetic of the, the digital extensions that we do is completely coherent with uh, Luke's vision for all of the practical things that they're building and the locations mm. that they're making. So it's a, it's a really close collaboration there. And then with, you know, working with people like, like Scott and the, the supervisors at the other vendors, it is talking, I mean, sometimes almost daily, you know, just going through things, um, going through reference inspirations, uh, talking about, you know, yeah, the, the things that, that, cause we all want to make sure that, the, that then the, the vendors and the supervisors at each vendor bring their own ideas into it. So often we're basically saying, Hey, this is what we're after, sort of in terms of the emotion of the scene, the aesthetics of the scene, but then giving them freedom to actually sort of expand on that as well. Mm, yeah. Sorry, Scott, I thought you were going to expand on that then, but you just nodded. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. Well, <laughs> absolutely. And that, that goes as well for my interactions with, with my crew in ILM mm. as well. And that, you know, you having, having I've been at ILM London now for, for nearly 10 years. So mm. I was part of the, the initial team that kind of set up the studio and helped recruit a lot of the artists. So I know how much it's worn out. Um, I know firsthand how much work has gone into building the team there. And you, you have this incredible, um, 
you know, slate of creative talent there. And, you know, it seems such a shame to basically sit there and go and tell them how to do, what to do and how to do it. Um, so I, again, like Moen with, with gives to me and the other vendors, you give them a uh, creative freedom to explore their own ideas as well and bring those ideas to the table because you've got this amazing team of creative brains mm. there who might think of something that you, you never would have thought of. And um, it's always a really fun process um, to to be surprised in in our daily review sessions with something that you you know somebody has just got. I've done I've done this, but then I've also done this, and we had a, quite a few moments like that on the show where there was, there was um, uh, for instance, in in the end sequence when we get into those close up uh, shots of the uh, the Death Star. Yeah. Um, one of our artists actually put in some modular blocks which um, are very recognizable shapes. I never discussed this with them. I never told them to do this. Um, but they were based on the original Death Star Trench from miniature <laughs> that yes. ILM in Van Nuys in LA did for the, for the first Star Wars movie. And he just kind of snuck them into the background in a little kind of Easter egg. And that <laughs> was just brilliant. So you, nice. it, it is really enjoyable when people kind of bring those ideas up. In terms think, of those kind of... Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, and, and I think ultimately that is what what makes this work shine in the end is that it's better than any individual person could have come up with because it's it's a product of so many talented people bringing their their best together you know so mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it is it's hundreds of artists you know worldwide as well i mean it's scott with ilm had had, had artists in, in in london as well as in vancouver all part of this team uh so it's it's getting you know all of the, the 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 cream of the crop that that work well with our individuals, vendor supervisors, but then can bring their 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 specific talents to to, to show, and uh, and it, it's it's magical. <laughs> how, how do you you know talking about the kind of the Death Star thing you mentioned there, Scott? You know how how much access do you have to? kind of legacy assets, I guess, is what I'm saying. Because, of course, we've got the, the number of movies, we've got the other TV <laughs> shows that have existed. You've got to fit within that universe, but obviously you want to bring something new to the project as well. How do you how do you go about finding that balance with the things you have access to, but also giving enough creative license to your artists to allow them to bring something new? Absolutely. I mean, we have, we're very lucky to have, you know, all of that, 40 plus years of, of legacy of ILM. So we have um, what we call our, our backlog, which is basically a big digital model toy shop, essentially, that we can, <laughs> uh, when we finish a show, we just um, package everything up and, and archive it. So we have a huge digital archive of all these cataloged vehicles and environments and, and assets that we put together for each show. Mm. So they're, they're all very well catalogued. So it's actually quite easy to find, you know, oh, do you remember this ship on Rogue One? Yes, we can go and find that and then bring it bring it back. Um, so we've got that aspect that we can trawl through all these different areas. And obviously we've got people, um, like Pablo Hidalgo, the, you know, our, our Star Wars kind of lore experts who mm. we can just um, check and make sure that everything is is kind of period correct mm. um when we're, we're we're dealing with the specific kind of timeline of the show and then also we've got we've got our our Lucasfilm archives as well the physical models that were actually made so mm. you know we've got you know amazing reference photography of um you know all of those miniatures that they can bring out their crates and you know photograph <laughs> whatever you need you know if you need a particular um part but you know um quite often we we have we i mean we're all star wars fans ourselves um you know we've got the books uh you know of the of the literatures so and we can kind of dive through those and find little bits and details of, of some of those because mm. obviously you know one of the things that that the the show with the with the spaceship work and the death star work is that we were trying to evoke that feeling of the miniature work that was done in the original trilogy so we really tried to lean into that aesthetic Mm. Yeah, it really felt like you guys nailed that in the show and in, you know, in, in its sort of predecessor, if you like, Rogue One. It felt like, I don't know, it felt like it had that tangible feeling to it, like I could reach out and touch those models, whether they were models or whether they were, you know, um, CG models. We talk, I talked about at the start this show not having those kind of big sort of showcase moments but of course there are some, you know, there are some in there. Um, Moen, the Eye of Aldani is... Um, 
a hell of a sequence. And, you know, I know from talking to you on the Andal panel that you spent a very long time working on that sequence. Where where do you draw inspiration for something like that? I think the, the phrase that, you know, visual effects uh, artists and supervisors may relish or, or, or worry about even is... Um, is uh, like nothing I've ever seen before. There was the phrase we yeah. talked about at the panel yeah, before. It, where, where do you begin? Well, well, definitely, yeah, it was definitely one of those one of those <laughs> moments um, where the expectation from Tony was to to have something that that felt you know like fresh and stunning and and beautiful. Um, there were uh, so early on, um, and it's like well before even principal photography started on on the show. We started talking about that sequence because uh, because it felt like one of the biggest design challenges we had on the show, um, in particular because it had to meet a number of criteria. It had to still feel like plausible and and grounded enough to fit overall in the show. You know, it could, you couldn't suddenly have something that that felt magical or, or uh, outlandishly fantasy in the show. Um, it had to look um, sort of mesmerizing and serene enough uh, that you believe that a religious sort of meditative festival could be based around that where people would watch it in silence as a you know religious festival. And then it had to still, when you fly into it, feel absolutely deadly and terrifying, like something that you could not safely fly a ship through. So um, we started early on uh, looking at all sorts of just like celestial phenomena from obviously like you know, meteors, shooting stars, um, auroras, uh, just general like space photography. Um, and we started with uh, with Scanline um, and and Yelm with the supervisor there to do a tests, um, just visual tests, um, which initially were actually probably uh, slightly too sort of like maybe scientifically driven. And when we showed mm -hmm. the first tests to to um, to Tony, he was like, no, it's not quite what I picture. And he sent us, which was at first terrifying because it was sort of like out of the spectrum of what we expected, um, pointillist uh, paintings of like um, of like skies where like these skies were just like, like ab not abstract, but like basically impressionist paintings of skies where mm. skies were made up out of like tiny dots of different colors. Mm. And he was like, like that, and we're like, oh my god, how are we going to justify being that in the sky? Um, and so, so we basically started going like, okay, well, it has to be basically meteors and it uh, like shooting stars, effectively, and they have to burn out in different colors. But then, how do we make this, you know, like interesting and and aesthetically pleasing? And um, one of the things were, which was interesting because it it wasn't necessarily how it was intended to be read was the event was called like the Eye of Aldani. And in uh, in Tony's mind, it was really just more more or less that, um, you know, like this opening would form like where they could fly out or initially think they could fly out at the end. But we started looking at close-up photographs of the human iris. And uh, in particular, if you look at close-ups of blue-eyed, you know, um, people like up close, there are these like incredibly complex patterns of like various colors like blue eyes have all of these greens and yellows and you right. know different isn't that that and these really thin lines that sort of weave around each other and so that actually became like a huge inspiration for the color palette and the um and also just sort of the aesthetic aesthetic of it uh and then lots and lots of iterations of you know trying stuff out and and um and the the thing that you you start with sort of five, six, seven um, test shots and get like versions going. And then suddenly there'll be one shot where you're like, ooh, that one's good. So how do we get that feeling now into the other shots and into the other angles? And it's it's really um, an exploration process rather than like a, a straight line to, to, a, um, to an idea. I have to say you absolutely nailed that sequence. I was sort of left, you know, mouth agape kind of looking at it on my big screen. Um, talking of big screens, like I, I, I interview a lot of people who work in, you know, movies that end up in movie theatres. Your show, of course, is not in movie theatres. But how do you go about reminding yourself of the scale on which 
people might be watching this because of course people at home now might have a 70 80 100 inch screen i mean we we do review things on both like very large tvs here and then ultimately there are multiple rounds of um reviews you know with the um with the colorist on like the most highly calibrated monitors you can have there are like high dynamic mm. range reviews that we do because there'll be a high dynamic range release um for for the show as well so um by the time by the time it it goes out we will have looked at every shot many 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 times on different devices in different um scenarios but there are for example on the other end there are considerations where you go well in a movie theater you can rely on the fact that people are always going to be in a dark room you know so you can mm. you can basically expose things differently where when you know that you're working for um for streaming television there that has to be a consideration that 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 things have to be more readable when there's more ambient light as well yeah mm -hmm. i mean in terms mm -hmm. of finishing you know we we don't look to finish only for a television type release you know, we finished everything in 4k uh hdr mm -hmm. we, we we've gone through all the the machinations to allow it to be viewed on any platform uh and and when we did the premiere for season one we did it at the el capitan in los angeles on a on a movie theater screen so you can you could project it on right. a screen and have the, the the same experiences on on your television at home, and and while we should should and need it, continue to to be mindful, you know, for some of these these aspects of of how the the show is made, we aren't restrictive either. We want to make sure you've got the the the, the, mm -hmm. the proper experience no matter what platform you're on. And there there is an element also of just sort of future proofing in the sense that. Right now, not everyone has a 4K or an HDR TV, but you want the show to still look good in 10 years when more people do. Yeah. Well, you know, if, if my local picture house had been showing every episode every Wednesday morning, I would have been straight down there buying a ticket. So <laughs> um, maybe, maybe that's something that we should think about in the future. Um, one of the other big sequences, of course, was the um, Luthen's lightsaber ship. Now, was that something... That was mentioned in the script, or is that something that came out of your work as as visual effects artists? That I mean, just conceptually, Scott can talk more about the execution of that. But uh, conceptually, that was actually a funny one because it it happened pretty late in the in the writing process. And I just got a phone call from Tony one um, Saturday actually, and he was like, "Yeah, I feel like we don't have a, like we're missing something. We we're, we need like a good um, like space beat in here. Um, you know, people mm -hmm. will be disappointed if we don't have that." And so he basically said, I'm thinking, you know, something like, um, you know, where it ended up was end of episode 11, initially was beginning of episode 12, Lewis and leaving Saw's um, uh, camp and effectively more or less running uh, into like a police patrol, you know, um, and having to find a yeah. way to, to fight his way out of that. And he kind of left it at that, um, basically saying like, can you, can you tell me what we can do? Because... He knew that that at this, particular at this point in the in the process, he couldn't just randomly add like a thing without some boundaries around it. And I was like, okay, well, let me think about what we can do that is achievable in terms of how much time it will take to shoot, how much time it will make to to execute, and how many new assets we're sort of bring in. And one of the things that I stumbled across uh, was there was this uh, ship, the the interdictor with uh, with a giant uh, um, dish on the front, right? that um, had been built for Solo, but barely used uh, in the movie. And I was like, oh, well, here's a thing that, that we can, you know, like make something out of that already exists, but hasn't, been, hasn't really been used before. I had just seen uh, Ad Astra, which is the uh, Brad Pitt movie, which has this beautiful opening sequence, which is sort of in the stratosphere, like on the edge of space and, and being in the atmosphere which I just really liked and we hadn't done in, in Star Wars as a location for a space battle, so I thought that would be cool. And then for the weapons, the the thing out of the conversation with um, Tony about Luthen's ship, one of the things he brought up early is that he said, like, well, I kind of want it to be like, like James Bond's Aston Martin in the sense that it looks <laughs> like a normal ship, but that has all of these hidden, you know, um, hidden gadgets and weapon and defense mechanisms in it. And so the the double that that double beam weapon um, that came out of two things like in, in my mind where I um, early on well one of the things the Aston Martin has is the the blades that come out of the tires you know <laughs> that can shred like cars that are <laughs> car next to it in the, in the classic one um, 
And so that's like a Ben Hur kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if there's something, something we can do like that, like a weapon that goes out to the sides. And then um, the other thing that influenced that was um, a moment that I really liked at the end of uh, Iron Man 2, where in the fight in the Japanese garden, he has like a, a one off laser weapon that shoots out two beams and he does like a spin and all of the remaining people around him basically like are like cut down by it and so i thought like okay let's try and pitch that we previewed it out and then i had to actually show it to pablo hidalgo and go like can we do this you know is this allowed in star wars <laughs> as, a, as a weapon <laughs> where are the boundaries you know, yeah <laughs> like we've done like beam weapons before you know you can have a beam that basically is like a continuous beam but it should be something that it's like there's a limitation on it, you, which is why you're mm. saying like, okay, you have to kind of like charge it up and then he can fire it, you know? So long, long story short, like a lot, a lot of thought that <laughs> went into it. But again, it sort of like evolved over, over time. And Scott, that execution of that shot, then just trying to make sure, you know, it does fit in within, within those boundaries, you know, visually and the, and the way it moves and the way that weapon is utilized. That must be sort of a difficult kind of tightrope to walk. Definitely, yeah. I mean, just the task of actually integrating the weapon into the ship's design in a way that, you know, like Mo was saying about the Aston Martin, you know, you could look at it and you'd never know that it's armed to the teeth. Um, so we had to figure out a way of actually hiding the cannons inside the ship's design and then allowing a way for them to deploy. Now, I'd always like the the design of the the in in the film Troy and the design of the spark and shields which had a kind of a notch cut around them and mm. put their steer through it so we had this kind of thought that we could basically bring the wings up uh to a kind of a vertical position where there's a notch out of the bottom of the wing through which the cannon would then kind of come out of the the the, the wing kind of fulcrum uh, which was chunky enough to allow because th th this thing has to the cannon can't be the, a, a tiny kind of pea shootery type thing. It has to be kind of a chunky. Um, the, the, the body of it has to look like it's something you have to charge up for thirty seconds before releasing this enormous blast of energy. So um, <laughs> the, the 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 main wing pivots were these big solid cylindrical barrels, which you know felt like a good place to put them on. So we had doors that opened on them. And the cannon would then come through that. That's, um, yeah, that took a lot of time just to kind of figure out the the the, the mechanics of how that would work plausibly. Mm. Well, you talked earlier, um, Mo, and you, you mentioned about you know having these real locations that kind of anchor you at least. I mean, obviously, with something like that that we've just talked about with the ship, you know, you've got this kind of open doors kind of situation and you're trying to work out the boundaries yourself. How important are those boundaries to have though with the with the kind of location work because you know i talked about that um Corriton refinery wasn't it in essex you know which gives the the whole thing an industrial look you also shot at the barbican and um at mclaren mclaren's f1 um site in in woking how important is it to have those kind of grounded location shoots for you to kind of build upon yeah i think it's i think it's it's really really valuable because um everyone goes into shooting the shots with a clear intent of of what you want beta so what we normally do is we'll do a location scout um well beforehand uh so we'll go there with the directors the dp the production designers um and uh take lots of photos and then the production designers will actually uh, with our input um work out how if we're going for example to the mclaren building uh, which is a beautiful uh, piece of architecture um how we transform that into a Coruscant spaceport, right? And so uh, there's a bit of negotiation going on in terms of like, well, we have to make sure that we actually keep enough of the legation to make it worth going there, but then at the same time aren't hamstrung that it, you can't make it feel like it's Star Wars. And so um, we uh, we basically agree early on on like, okay, what are the key angles that we're going to shoot in a location like that? Then the art, like concept art will basically create paint overs of our photos and go like okay this is this is how it's going to look when it's all done um and then with that the the director and the dp can actually go in there and go like okay i understand now if i shoot this way then 
we're keeping this and there's going to be space spaceship out of this window and you know all of those things um which is so so much better than than having someone shoot just into a blue screen and go like yeah you know we'll both put a spaceship there later and you know don't worry about it so um sometimes it does create um maybe not more work but different work than ultimately in post production mm. and Scott can talk about because um Obviously, if you don't have a big blue screen there, there's a lot more roto. There's a lot more manual work to try and fit the the digital and the um, and the real together. But I think ultimately you you just still end up with something that feels more real. Oh, absolutely. You know, when you when you're able to a, a full plate gives you that initial starting block where you've got you know you've got the the quality of the light that's actually hitting the environment. You've got the light direction. You're already off to a great start, and that you know that that in, in order to make your digital extensions look real, you know, you're, you, you're already got a model that you can kind of work towards. Um, and actually just going back to the, the, the theme of the happy accidents, one of the things that we noticed about the plate, um, one of the plates in, in, uh, the McLaren building was these beautiful reflections of the, they have a lake outside and the sun was hitting these, this, this lake and then bouncing into the building. And creating these beautiful caustic reflections, moving shimmering reflections on some of the bridges and structures. And you know, we'd initially thought of that's you know because we're getting we're we're removing most of the outside. You know, that's like okay, that's something we're going to have to remove from the inside because how do you you know how do you justify that? And then it it kind of gradually kind of dawned that we, well maybe we could actually justify those by having something outside that actually causes that. So we built a little moat that runs around the outside that, you know, we just hit a bit of sunlight kind of just to sparkle for little sparkles in the water. And that again, is just little things that help tie what's going on in the plate with what's going on in the extension that you may not actually, you know, consciously, uh, see. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of interpret, but they all just help to kind of create this overall picture of everything just being this one photograph. Yeah, it really yeah. does help you you buy the situation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and and I think that's that two things. They're one perfect example of things that that I would have never thought of when we're on location shooting. That I was just like, oh god, these reflections. But if I have to take all of them out. <laughs> And so when, when Scott and the team pitched it, I was like, oh my God, that's a brilliant idea. And it's actually, it's so much better. And that it it also, it forces complexity into the digital environments that you otherwise wouldn't necessarily do. You know, like it, it so often happens that um, even with just locations like with like skies and, and things like that, where you, in your mind, you go like, oh yeah, when we're going to go there, it's going to be all like this kind of weather. Like in, in uh, scene one in Scotland, there's a scene uh, at the top of a mountain that um, where they're, they're having a conversation. And initially, when this was uh, written and when we were planning it, we're all like, yeah, it's going to be a great scene. And you're going to have like these vistas of like Scotland in all directions. And then we showed up that morning and it was so foggy that you had like visibility of, I don't know, like 50 feet or less. Um, <laughs> and so it was just like this big white soup. But the scene suddenly felt much more atmospheric and it actually really helped the tone of the scene that it was sort of claustrophobic. And and so I think it's things like that that are, are fun because those are things that are kind of forced on you, but then ultimately make it feel more real because not everything is, is designed by someone by hand. It's the, yeah. the unexpected. It, it certainly friction. adds an intimacy, doesn't it, when you have that fog around. Sorry, TJ. I was saying the, the un unexpected restrictions of the shoot, you know, so if we go in with a good basis of an understanding of a location, uh, everybody on the production team knows what they're shooting, but you still are restricted by the location. You still have to get the right camera angles. You don't have a wall you can just remove to get a camera where you want it to be. You have to shoot within the location. But then for us as well, once once you have that plate, just as, as Scott and, and Moan have described with the, the water of McLaren, you have another restriction or something within to work that you perhaps had never expected. And so it just allows everyone to think about things in a slightly different way and approach in a different way than if you only had a true blank canvas that, that then sometimes becomes too perfect. Yeah. And I think it's also like ultimately even for full CG shots, 
on this on this show, um, we we always held ourselves to the standard of, well, if you if you had to shoot this, how how would you actually shoot this? Like, would this be a helicopter shot? Would it be a drone shot? Would it be a crane shot? And ultimately, if it felt like, well, the the shot that we're doing, like as a full CG shot, wouldn't be achievable with a real camera. We said, well, let's not do that. You know, let's basically limit ourselves to things that where where it's a, it's a choice. You know, there are other movies where you have cameras that fly through a keyhole and you know do all sorts of crazy things. But um, for for our show, I think for that grounded feel, keeping even full CG shots limited by the limitations of real cameras was actually really good. Yeah, I, I I really think in watching the show, you know, when when ILM invited me to come and do that panel, I had to watch the show again because I hadn't noticed the effects, you know, in in the best possible way. Um, obviously, there are those key moments where you kind of you know it's an effect, but of course you're caught up in the story. But what struck me about Andor that stands out from other TV shows that I've seen in recent years is all of the work that you've done is always driving the story. It's always driving the character. It's never about showing off. It's never about showcasing a new technology. It's just a serving the character and serving the story. And that's that's the important thing here, isn't it? No, it really is. And and I mean, we had just under four thousand shots. So over the course of the series, it there's there's a lot of work in there. It's a, there's a lot of invisible work, but there's a lot of big work. So we've got everything from from giant CG shots to to, to simpler paint outs to extensions that become uh, organic within the scene and it's it's the seamlessness that we're striving for you don't want to notice the work you want to be able to just experience the show have it serve the story and and be able to enjoy it without noticing that 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 there's visual effects happening yeah and we often often sort of um kind of restricted again sort of the if if something in the background became too attention grabbing you know, we just go like, let's take it out. It's, we're not supposed to be looking there. We're supposed to be looking at the actor. Mm. I, I'm kind of wondering now, like I'm thinking, you know, I was up at the South Bank the other day and I was thinking, oh, you know, this this has got a kind of croissant feel to it. It's got the kind of Barbican concrete we, look we to it. So I'm sort there. of... <laughs> you did, yeah, all right. You we, almost we, did. We, we did a location wreck. He's there actually, yeah. Right. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to keep my eyes out for, you know, season two shooting. That's what I'm saying. But well, I, I guess my question really is, <laughs> given that you've gone down that route of having those those physical known locations, is that kind of driving you to just keep that same aesthetic and for, for season two and, and not shoot in, in locations anymore because it's already defined those locations? Or are you seeking out locations that further expand on the ideas that you had in season one? Yeah, we're we're definitely keeping that same philosophy going of of always anchoring shots in something real and something tangible. Like we we basically sort of what isn't strictly true, but we we always said like, well, let's try to have like the first you know like like fifty feet in front of camera be real. You know, like let's have the things that people stand in that they interact with be real, and then we'll we'll augment around that, we'll build around that, but. But um, that philosophy is definitely carrying on at season two as well. As a last question, I just wanted to, I'm just interested to kind of know about your interaction with the production designer, Luke Cole, that you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, fantastic work on this show. Obviously, he's building his sets down in Buckinghamshire and choosing locations and augmenting them with, you know, certain builds. Does does he then have a lot of uh, work with you in terms of the post production? Like after the initial shooting, is is he with you at ILM looking over stuff, or is his work done in the physical world? So we, um, uh, like TJ and I, after the uh, after the shoot finishes, we're actually co-locating with editorial in, into production offices. So and um, that's where basically like we kept regularly checking in with Luke, uh, obviously. With uh, season one, we knew that there would be a season two, so Luke was staying on through uh, that period right. anyway. And um, we would basically just, I would try to keep those, you know, regular conversations with him going. So if we had work in progress, we would show it to him like once a week or so and go like, hey, you know, what what do you think about where this is headed? Um, he still had a couple of concept artists going that would help out, you know, fill out um, blank spots where... Um, we uh, and and also then just work coming in again from um, from vendors, you know, and from from Scott's team. Uh, like they'll do like a first pass layout of something, a first pass design, 
And then I would try to get that in front of Luke. We'd have a chat about it. And um, I think he and I, like 90% of the time, clicked really well. But I, I found it really in, incredibly useful to sort of get his, get his input on it. Yeah, by design. I mean, we have these people who have been so instrumental and, and with the show for so long. To be able to, to, to call on them as a resource through the post-production period is, is immensely helpful. And, it's a, and Luke is one of those key collaborators. Now, I wouldn't normally ask this question on my podcast about, you know, what's your favorite, this, that or the other. But as we're talking about an awards ceremony here and we're talking about your your nomination, could you each in turn just take a moment to tell me what your favorite shot is in the show? Even if it's not a shot that you worked on, I just I'd be interested to know. Um, oddly, because it's it's not it's not a particularly like attention grabbing shot. I keep going back to um there's a shot which we shot at the Barbican, which is a very high wide shot of just seeing um, Clea walk towards her meeting um, with Vel, uh, like a, the secret meeting that they have there. And um, I love that shot because it, it uh, to me, it, it it embodies like a lot of what we hope to accomplish with, with Coruscant to make it feel at the same time like true to the prequels and like a fantasy it like insane metropolis but also like a real place and and it was one of those where we replaced probably 80 percent of the frame with cg and yet having shot that plate i was so pleased that like it just all came together and it feels like a real place and so that that's one of my my favorite shots in the show and and probably a shot where you had to to get rid of reflections from that lake below as well right <laughs> <laughs> um that that one no that one's kind of a it's a different corner. shot oh okay yeah, in, oh you're the thinking of the, the big big wide one yeah okay yeah nice. uh yeah i'll 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 choose one of one of our all cg shots which is the a, a top down look as as we're establishing coruscant we we travel over over buildings and we see you know essentially it's it's a new york type establisher um it's it's a really fun, I mean we don't have a lot of establishing shots in in the show it's the you know as, as we've talked about we we haven't put in an egregious number of shots they all serve a purpose they all have a reason um and and this establisher as we as we bring us back into Coruscant really is is to me kind of the embodiment of of big Star Wars in the grounded reality of of the show that that Tony had, had pitched and that 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 Moen has been protecting and that that's that's the type of establisher you'll see in in any other major metropolitan city establishing shot on any show. You can get it with a helicopter. Uh, it takes you into the city, and yet we're in our 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 fantasy of, of Coruscant and getting to experience the city like the locals would on any other television show you'd see in Coruscant. It just it, that's one that 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 really stands out to me. Mm -hmm. Great, Scott. Can I have two? Sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Always asking for more. Um, I think there's two. There's there's the uh, the first shot in the space battle sequence where we see the the what was the the original design for the Star Destroyer kind of heave into view, and it was just such a beautifully executed shot with the with the you know, so well um, realized in previews um, before. Um, but kind of on a slightly a, a more personal note, I suppose my 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 first jobs in the industry were actually as a model maker. So I was fortunate enough to catch the tail end of the model making era of of visual effects. So you know, um, it was so nice to be able to really lean into that aesthetic. And very much, you know, the, the Star Wars visual effects were the reason I got into this in the first place. So trying to make things look like um, the the models that you know I knew so well from from my my youth was a real pleasure to actually really try and dig into the details of that, and also um, for the the it was to be able to bring one of Colin Cantwell, who was the original one of the very first production designers on on Star Wars, to bring one of his creations to to life, and um, you know obviously Colin uh, unfortunately died just in the, in the uh, you know, while we're just finishing off the show. So it was a lovely uh, way to be able to kind of pay a little bit of tribute to him as well, because, you know, in the, in the audio, you can hear that the, it says uh, it's a Cam-12 class mm -hmm. um, uh, ship. So I thought that was a really nice tribute and lovely to be part of that as well. And then the other thing um, was, probably it's not even an ILM 
sequence actually it is the Eye of Aldani. I think that was one of the most spectacular sequences that just completely blew me away. Mm -hmm. um, the complexity and the detail uh, of that was just yes, yeah, stunning. Great, no, good answer. Yeah, I, I had that same moment with the Cat, uh, Colin Cantwell, um, you know, design there. I sort of thought, oh, that's for me, you know, because I'm <laughs> I'm a huge nerd that goes way back. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys, for your time. It's great to see you again. I hope to see you again in the future. Maybe, you know, we can talk about Andor 2 the next time. Um, and, uh, you know, it always is a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and, you know, what I love about you guys is you're just as enthusiastic on the inside as we are on the outside. Um, so, you know, at the panel, this is the moment where I asked a thousand people to give you applause, but I'll just give you some myself. <laughs> and good luck to you. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Jamie. Thank you so much, Jamie. Really appreciate it.